Welcome to the We Are Libertarians presidential series debates. This is part of a series of 10 debates with every candidate for president formally invited to participate and provide their ideas on a variety of issues. Today, I'm joined by Ben Letter, Arvin Vora, Christopher Marks, Daniel Berman, and William Hurst. And we'll be discussing healthcare. Candidates, you'll have two minutes to answer the questions. At the end of your allotted time, I will simply say time. And you must quickly wrap up your thought. You can also finish and yield the remainder of your time. I will ask the question and call on you in a random order to answer. While I am a libertarian, I've designed these questions to be challenging and have modeled both the questions and the format after the major presidential debates, not the friendly formats that you might be used to. My audience is tasked with evaluating the quality of these responses. I will be judging you based on how prepared you are for the challenges. Uh, how well you understand the questions, and how well you manage your time and how compelling your answers are to make all Americans and not just libertarians support your candidacy. At the end, you'll have three minutes to issue a closing statement, which you may use to summarize your feelings on healthcare, challenge an opponent's response to a question, and or address an issue that you don't feel got adequately addressed during the debate. Candidates, here we go. First question. Medical expense adds $1.1 trillion to the deficit every year. 20 years ago, it was our third highest expense. Today, it has eclipsed Social Security and is nearly double the combined cost of our national defense. Economists all over the world argue that the cheapest way to cover the health care costs for everyone is to have everyone pay into a single pot. This single-payer system has worked for countries like Canada, the UK, Japan, and Switzerland. Should we adopt this strategy? If not, isn't the problem only getting worse? And I will throw that question to you, Arvin. This culture has produced this government, and this culture has produced this healthcare system, this bloated, expensive, inefficient healthcare system. In the 1950s, here in the United States of America, normal middle class people could afford to have doctors come to their houses to treat them and their kids. It wasn't a bizarre luxury service the way it is now, it's just normally what you had. Today, We've made medic medical care unaffordable and bad. You now wait in waiting rooms. Doctors rush from one patient to the other. Instead of getting that deep, caring quality care, you get this nonsense. And that has been caused by the government. My proposal is to change this culture starting right with the FDA. And that means to get the FDA out of the way so that medicine doesn't have to be expensive. We need to have lower costs. The medicines need to actually be cheaper, not just somebody else pay for them, but actually be cheaper. And here's some of the things that I wanna do. Number one, the best doctors in Switzerland and Japan should be able to practice medicine in America just as easily as the worst American trained doctors. That's what we have right now. Today, foreign doctors can't practice in America. I'm going to end that practice. I'm going to allow foreign doctors to practice here so that medical costs go down. I'm going to allow Americans to buy, buy medicines from overseas. Today, identical medicines are sold overseas for a fraction of the price by the same companies as they are in America. The government stops us from importing them back, and I'm going to end that blockade. If pharmaceuticals companies want to charge a different cost in other countries, they're going to expect that we are going to buy it cheaper. Healthcare can be made affordable by ending the FDA by ending these ridiculous requirements that foreign great foreign doctors can't practice in America, and by these ridiculous pharmaceutical protections, I have a lot more to say on how to lower costs, but I'm out of time right now. My name is Arvind Vora. Chris. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Christopher Marks. I think that this situation it can be best embodied in a thing that we have that we're currently have heard a lot about it's the affordable care act the affordable care act cause it was the government's mandate that the people purchase a consumer product health insurance from that it, as well it also mandated that those health insurance companies provide health insurance for people that had pre-existing conditions. This did a couple of things. What it did was it actually created, it increased all health insurance costs and not just for the, for the people. It also increased the cost for health insurance for the employers that are mandated to actually provide those health, that health insurance for their employees. 
But the little known fact is this also increased the health insurance costs for, for those who are the medical care providers um, through their malpractice insurance. Um, it also, because of all of these insurances, it, it, these insurance practices cost increase, it also increased this thing that a lot of states use called third party, um, third party administrators. This overall increase in cost also caused your medical care providers to increase their cost to compensate because of this. Government got involved and made things worse. If we were moved, a lot of these, the necessity for insurance, the governmental involvement, um, the mandate that insurance be, uh, that people purchase insurance, which has actually already in, been resolved by the Supreme Court, um, you're going to see that your medical care providers are going to be able to do the job that they ultimately want to do, and that's provide sure insurance to their consumers, and they're going to be able to do it cheaper. All right. Thank you. Uh, Dan. Hey, I'm Dan, taxationist left Berman. And to answer your question, I, I think Arvin really got a lot of good points on this. And it's, you know, we look at the healthcare system and we hear Bernie Sanders is always saying, hey, everybody needs to have free health care. And what's, what's so wrong about that? What's wrong about free health care, right? It sounds awesome. We're all going to be healthy. We're all going to be taken care of. And it's not going to cost us anything. It sounds great. Who wouldn't want that? The reality is it's not really free. It's, there's a cost and someone's going to pay for it. And what's interesting about this discussion is we're always fighting over who's going to pay for it. And we, you know, we talk about uh, the, the expense and sharing the costs and all these other things and, and uh, the insurance and, and how we're going to spread that cost. But, and then we get upset at, hey, there are these big corporations making all this money. Well, if all we're going to do is share the cost and we're going to come up with this program that's going to make everybody pay so that we all pay less, even the healthy people are paying for something that, that they don't need, we're still ending up with these corporations who are making massive, massive profits. And the only way that we can really fix the system is to say, okay, look, those people don't need to be making these massive profits off of this thing. They're, they're basically, you know, extorting us with fear to make us pay into the system. We're, we're thinking we're going to die. And so we have to just give over, you know, hand over all of our money. And that's, that's how they get us. And we need to look at the system. And a lot of the things that Arvin mentioned, deregulating the FDA or allowing competitive markets in that, in that place are going to lower the cost. That means we're going to take the profit away from these big corporations, not by force, not by price fixing but by creating an actual free market where we can, we can afford to choose what we want, how we want to take care of ourselves. And through those choices, we're going to lower the costs. And that means that we're not going to have to worry about insurance. We'll be able to afford the care that we want. And we'll be able to choose the care that we want without having to, to worry about who's going to pay for it. Right at two minutes. William, your time. Uh, do we have William here? You might need to unmute yourself. Sorry, go ahead. There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Mr. Marks talked about the cost of admin, and the figure on that is 25 to 30 percent of every of every visit to the doctor. Tax on 25 to 30 percent strictly for admin fees, and these fees are pre-authorization of healthcare uh, for insurance and the fight over denials of insurance. Uh, another thing that Dan touched on was the fact that we don't actually have a free market uh, medical health care system. Uh, as far as a free market goes, we have far too many regulations when it comes to medical. Uh, doctors are regulated before they can even start working on patients. Uh, we, we have a system that ha is set up to where you have to have six to eight years before you can start actually handling patients. You may be able to do that as a trainee, but if we set up or even allow for, let's say, a minimum amount of training to handle the majority of reasons that people go to a doctor, that's going to reduce the cost right there. People are not going to be spending as much on education. They're not going to have to charge as much for services. And we can reduce, we can realistically reduce 40 to 50% of the cost right there on just these two areas. And I yield the rest of my time. Great. Ben. 
Well, healthcare is like a big issue in this country. I saw people arguing about it today on Facebook. And we have been suckered. We don't have free markets in, in healthcare. That is the problem. Deregulation is key. We need to deregulate medicine across the board. Um, and the question comes down to who's going to pay for it or how are you going to pay for it? If the markets were deregulated, we would see all kinds of options on how to pay for health care. Uh, one that comes to mind that I've always wondered why we don't see more of is, is health care financing. When you go to buy a car, uh, a car is usually more than your average surgery. Uh, and you can buy that and, and you can finance that for five or six years uh, if you want. And if, if you don't, if you don't need a car, if you don't need a surgery, uh, then you don't, you don't need to buy one. Um, there's uh, in-house programs where doctors could sell direct. See, the problem is, is that we've created a racket and medical billing is just a code. You walk into a hospital or a doctor's office and the staff at the desk, they can't tell you the prices of the x-ray. They don't know. They're not used to asking. They're just used to, um, uh, you know, billing an insurance company. And what this has taken away from us is the, the negotiation power. When you go to buy a car, um, you have the ability to negotiate the price. If you don't like the price at that dealership, you go to the next dealership, you negotiate a better price. You, the, that's what makes the free market competitive. What we've done by fixing the prices and fixing the market is, is we've taken all the competition, all the incentive uh, to compete on, on prices uh, out of the industry and instead, uh, people compete on, you know, how many upsells that they can bill your ins insurance company for. It's a mess, and the key to it is deregulation. I yield the remainder of my time. All right, you're, you're two minutes. Perfect. Uh, next question. It's easy to say we should default on our debt and cease payments, but we are behind on payments to healthcare professionals to the tune of $30 trillion, not including the debt. If we tell them they won't ever be receiving these payments in order to relieve the debt, we essentially guarantee to quadruple the cost of healthcare across the nation. But if we are determined to pay them, we are tasked with paying back something larger than the entire combined debt itself. What is the solution here? Ben, we'll start with you. The solution is, is, is really more simple than we'd all like to admit. Uh, there's a, a, a meme that's uh, gone around that's an exercise that takes a bunch of zeros away from the debt and, and the GDP and, and essentially takes it down to around, you know, close to average household or average income numbers. And when people see this, if you were to see this type of spending um, in your personal finances, you would have to make a change. You would have to. Um, we've been passing the, the, the bill around because it's like, who's to blame? Is it, is it your fault? Is it your fault? Whose fault here is it? None of us, none of us made it this way. Um, once again, the key is deregulation because deregulation cuts all that government cost. Of, they're not effective. They're not efficient at running business. They're not competitive. We can take, we can take all of this spending out of the debt by letting the free market do its job. And no matter, the thing about the free market is, is, is people talk about, you know, this group of people or that group of people. And, and the thing about the free market is, is the free market always, if, if, if somebody finds a niche, if an entrepreneur finds a niche, they, they cater to that niche. And all niches get catered for, you know. Um, the key is to rein in spending and we can cut all these taxes, eliminate all these programs, free markets. I yield. Great. Uh, Daniel. So uh, with a lot of these things, if we look at the big picture and we look at just kind of the net of, you know, what's going in and what's coming out of a system, a lot of these systems can actually be, you know, we, we talk about money that's going to go to a doctor, but then we're also talking about money that's going to be taken from that doctor in terms of taxes and fees and licensing and regulations and all these other things, opportunities and costs and forcing them to pay um, you know, to, to employ administrators and all these other things. If you, if you start loosening up those, those regulations to where 
they don't have these costs. They don't have to give half of their profit over to the government. They don't have to pay so much for their licensing and everything else. It, the net effect is that they're still making money and they're still happy. And the reality is we need to, we need to start looking at these things. These are, you know, uh, there's, there's, uh, you know, you can, you can tell somebody, Hey, I'm going to give you a hundred million dollars and, and you're going to be wealthy, but Hey, the, the catch is I get to tax 99% of it. Well, you're not really making a hundred million dollars. And so, you know, when you look at, when you look at a system like this, what are the doctors really making? And sometimes, sometimes the doctors are struggling to get by. They're not, you know, they're not making millions of dollars every year. Like, you know, some people think like doctors are the wealthiest profession. Um, some of them are struggling and it's because of all the regulations and everything else. And when you start getting rid of this, you know, you can, you can make their lives easier and they're not so concerned about getting past debts paid. And especially if we're talking about, um, defaulting on some debt, we're also going to have to forgive some debt and, and, you know, but things are going to clear themselves up. And it's, you know, if I owe you money and you owe me money, we can cancel that out. And Hey, there's nobody lost. No, nobody loses. Great. William. Do you uh, repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, essentially we have a great deal of debt. Uh, we owe healthcare providers $30 trillion. If we don't pay them back or just say we're not going to pay them back, the cost, it's estimated that the cost of healthcare will quadruple. If we do pay them back, we're, ta we're tasked with paying back $30 trillion, which is larger than the debt itself. And so it's just saying, what is your solution as president? We may have to work on making a deal with that because it's not a realistic number that we can pay back. Uh, you know, they would want that with interest. Uh, maybe make the deals like uh, Dan was talking about where deregulating certain things would help them gain more money. And basically fixing the industry itself would help them enough that maybe they would deal out of some of that debt. The debt is incurred which means we will have to pay it with being responsible. So we would have to work out deals with the people we owe in order to be able to pay that back without stealing from other people to do so. And I yield my time. Oh, Arvin, go ahead. Pody, I'm going to have to very strongly disagree with that premise, which says that if we don't pay back all the doctors this money, then they're gonna increase the cost for future people. That's not how it works. If we don't, if the government doesn't pay back that Medicare and Medicaid and all that stuff, then more doctors are going to jump ship. And a lot of doctors have jumped ship. A lot of doctors are refusing to take Medicaid. They're refusing to take Medicare. Many are refusing to take any insurance at all and going pure free market. And I say, let's reward them. Let them know that they made the morally right decision, the strategic decision. And those doctors right now that have a small or medium-sized practice, I want them to be bigger than Kaiser. I want the, them to be gigantic because they chose the free market. And when you choose the free market, good things happen. I want to see happening in medicine what we're seeing happening right now in education. In education, so many people are opting out of the broken system and choosing homeschooling. In medicine, it's beginning, it's tiny. We're not talking about millions and millions of people like in homeschooling, it's tiny, but it's growing. And some of those innovators, those medical innovators are doing such amazing work. They post their prices, their prices are affordable. Many people I know, including me, have thought about moving near such a clinic because it's such a great thing. To make that happen though, we need to get the government out of the way. That's why I want to end the FDA. I want to end Medicare. I want to end Medicaid. I want to end Obamacare. I want to end all government licensing of doctors and let the free market do, do what it does best, which is help allow us to choose what works the best and what costs the least. The great thing about free market healthcare is that you have price competition. You have an incentive to lower costs. Let's bring that incentive back. Let's reward the people who chose the free market and let's encourage more people to jump ship on the broken government system. All right, Christopher. Well, 
I think that what we need to do is we need to remove the state requirement that these these medical care providers utilize third party administrators. I think that we need to remove the concept of the mandatory if med, if medical care providers having mandatory malpractice insurance. I think that there's an alternative solution to that, and that would be maybe for them to actually manage the manage a trust fund for malpractice situations. Um, and we need to certainly need to get rid of the mandata mandatory um, health insurance for people. Uh, I think when we ultimately get rid of all of these kinds of situations, you're going to see that your medical care providers are going to be able to provide, health, uh, provide that care and service at a significantly cheaper rate. Um, and we don't have to worry about, you know, unlicensed, uneducated, unlicensed individuals providing medical care. And I don't think that, in, and we certainly need to make sure that there is that liability coverage in place for when those, it, when those mishaps actually occur. Um, deregulation sounds nice it, uh, on the outside it sounds like it would be beneficial to all but there are certain regulations that need to be in place and they need to be maintained well there are these uh, where are these overburdensome regulations that are not unnecessary and just do nothing more than destroy the bottom line for the medical care providers and increase the overall cost to the consumer i yield my time you two minutes anyhow. That's fine. Candidates, we'll move on to the third question. During the Affordable Care Act discussions, the one thing Republicans and Democrats agreed upon was that insurance should cover pre-existing conditions. However, this mandate has drastically increased the cost of insurance, with most, most programs now charging over triple the cost of what they used to before the ACA. With out-of-pocket costs on basic life-saving medicines approaching five figures every month, not having insurance is a death sentence for these people. Is it better to save more lives with the expense to insurers or hand out a death sentence for lacking the, site, the foresight to be insured? Is, or do you have another option? And I'll begin with William. William, you might still right. be uh, there. You go. Pre-existing conditions as far as insurance goes, uh, you kind of have to cover that for the main reason of you, you're not going to have anybody being able to get insurance if they have a pre-existing condition. Who would want to accept somebody that's going to be at the doctor 24-7, well not 24-7, but in the gist of it, uh, who is going to accept that patient and who is going to uh, accept that they're going to have to pay for this patient no matter what. Uh, if you leave it up to choice, not many places are going to do it. And any place that will accept that will accept a lot of them and accept a lot of that responsibility. So that's where we have to run into causes or cases for charity. Uh, charity would have to handle some of that if we went that direction. Uh, now, as far as pre-existing pre conditions go, they're, they can call, uh, call anything a pre-existing condition right now. Uh, let's say you get into a car accident, you break your leg or something like that, and uh, you get a couple big cuts. A couple years down the road, you have a pulmonary embolism from a blood clot that reaches your lung. A, uh, an insurance agency can claim that that is a pre-existing condition from a car accident that you had prior to that. Uh, other things leading from there would be the, the possibility of an infection at the, the hospital. Would they want to continue paying for you after that point or would they want to try to drop you like insurance companies do now. All right, Arvid. 
Absolutely right. not. Uh, there, there's the idea that you should be required to cover a pre-existing condition is basically turning insurance into welfare. Insurance is designed to manage risk, not to redistribute wealth. You can have something else designed to redistribute wealth. I don't support the welfare state, but I mean, that's welfare. Insurance should be efficient. It should be low cost. It should be affordable. It should be something that you get to mitigate risk. Now, the issue that we're dealing with here is not so much an insurance issue. We're dealing with a price issue. The reason that these things become such an issue, they become so significant, is that insurance, that the medical care that it's paying for itself costs so much. Why does it cost so much? It costs so much because we've created an artificial labor shortage. That's by preventing foreign doctors from practicing in America. We've then created an artificial medicine shortage by preventing people from buying drugs from, from other countries and by driving up the regulatory cost of drugs in America. The result, it's, not, it's bad for people with pre-existing conditions and it's bad for everyone else too. Today, if you have a rare disease, not a pre-existing one, just a, a rare one, you, if you contract a rare disease, you will never, ever, ever, ever see a cure. You know why? Because the regulatory costs are so high that even if the medicine is complete, even if it's known to work, it'll often sit there on a lab bench rotting away rather than go through the expensive phase three trials. That's what's happening because of things like the FDA. I want to get rid of the FDA. I want to get rid of all these border protections because I want to drive down the cost of medicine. Medicine should, having a, the disease, having a pre-existing condition should not be a death sentence. It should be a minor financial nuisance. It should be no different than if you need to replace your roof. Yeah, it's annoying. You have to have people do it. It's a lot of work. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day no one views a leaky roof as a permanent ongoing problem. With pre-existing conditions, the solution is to drive down the cost of medicine using the free market, not to turn insurance into welfare. All right, Daniel. Man, you really got to stop letting Arvin go right before me. <laughs> um, so I, I really agree with a lot of what Arvin said, but I, I, wanna, I really want to speak to people who are ill right now because that's, you know, that's really who's concerned about this. this these are people you might, have, you might have cancer, you might have diabetes, um, some, some ongoing risk that it's hard for you to get insurance, but you need to consider this, right? If I were to go to you and I were to ask you, hey, I want to give you some money. I want to give you, I want to give you $1,000 every month and I want you to give me $5,000 every month in return. It doesn't sound like a fair deal, does it? And that's because that's, that's really what you're asking an insurance company to do. It's, it's you know, just like Arvin said, it's not welfare. It's, it's risk. It's gambling. It's, it literally is a form of gambling. It's saying, I hope that I'm not going to get a disease, but if I do, I'm paying a little bit of money so that that will be covered. But now, you know, so you're already sick and, you know, you're looking at, okay, well, if, they're, if I can't give somebody $1,000 for them to give me the $5,000 back, how am I going to afford the $5,000 a month per care that I can't afford with my income? Well, the reality is, if we fix all these regulatory issues, we can get the cost of your care down to $500 a month. Half of what you're going to pay to an insurance company, you're going to be able to get the care that you need and you're not going to have to worry about dealing with insurance companies. You're not going to have to worry about like all their, all their, you know, jerking you around and saying, oh, well, we don't cover this or, or, you know, something was, you have to pay deductibles and all this and giving them more money and your premiums going up. You won't have to deal with that. All you're going to do is you're going to, the cost of your medication is going to go down and down and down. And there are going to be multiple choices for you to choose from where you want to get it. And you can compare costs and some might give you better care for a little bit more. Some are going to cost a little bit less and maybe not have some extras. And that's going to be your choice. And you're going to be free to do that. And you're going to get the care that you want. And you're going to be spending Fine. less than you're paying on insurance right now. Great. Christopher. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, that you, I think that this is essentially two separate questions. When we're talking about pre-existing conditions, you're talking about a medical care provider, things from a medical care provider aspect. Um, you go into the doctor's office and you have a pre-existing condition. Um, you know, if you have cancer, you get insurance and that's a pre 
pre-existing condition and now you're actually spending a lot of this a lot of time in the hospital stuff along those lines that is more of a medical care provider aspect and i think in that in that situation insurance is the problem insurance and the third party administrators is the thing that's actually driving up the cost to you the consumer as well as it, it causing a serious issue with the medical care providers bottom line um but then we have the aspect that another one that i've noticed uh dan as well as arvin discussing that's a separate question altogether health or the medical or the medicine itself and the use of the FDA. Now, while we want to go FDA is bad, government involvement is bad, I really wouldn't want to purchase insulin from, you know, China and have it shipped here. Um, I don't know what it's going to, what's going to be in it. It's not, it's, and I'm going to be putting that in and I'm going to, in my body and basing my, uh, my belief and trust in this thing that I don't know what it is in me. Um, I think that's going to be a more complicated question. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Benjamin. Oh, see, the beauty of, of alternative payment methods is the pre existing condition doesn't matter. Um, if, if you're looking at something like healthcare financing, uh, you're not getting approved based upon uh, how sick you are. Uh, you're getting approved based upon your ability to pay. Um, and I've got to believe that if we allow the uh, financial companies to compete against the insurance companies, that that would really open up the competition and that we would see you know, low interest rates on surgeries and expensive procedures uh, you know, like we do with, uh, you know, new vehicles or, uh, home mortgages. Um, that's something that I, I, a marketplace that I'd like to see emerge. Um, also, you know, cash basis, uh, the, the way we have been kind of br almost brainwashed to think about how healthcare is paid for is ridiculous. Imagine if we were going to the grocery store and we were buying our groceries with insurance. This sounds ridiculous. Why would you buy anything with, with, with insurance? Uh, we give away all our ability to negotiate a good price. We, we you know, take away all the incentive for businesses, medical businesses, medical service providers to compete against each other. We take it all away and they just bill the insurance company. Bill, 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 bill. And it's a racket. And we need to open up the market. We need free market solutions to healthcare options. Alternative options don't matter if you have a pre-existing condition. I'm not saying we need to ban insurance. If you want insurance, buy insurance. But we should have uh, a whole multitude of, of options on how to pay for healthcare. I yield. Okay. Two minutes on the dot, you're good. Uh, the attempt to repeal the ACA failed miserably in Congress. The president doesn't have the right to rescind it. Without a plan to replace it, attempting to eliminate the ACA is essentially a failure on its face. Would you let the ACA stand? Do you have a plan to replace it? If so, what is it? If not, how do you propose to work around it or succeed in a different way? And we will start with Dan. So that's an interesting question. I, I think, you know, first of all, the There are a lot of regulations that just need to be, you, you know, we need to get rid of them. If Congress isn't going to do it, we have to look at, okay, what's, what's going to be, um, you know, what can we control that's not part of that? Now, as part of the executive, we control, um, we control the agencies that are tasked with investigating and fining um, organizations that are not following these regulations. And with that power, we can say, you know, hey, we're not going to prosecute people because we don't believe that this is fair. We're destroying the markets, we're costing people money, and we're preventing them from, from getting the care that they need, which is literally killing them. This is not this is not fair. This is not constitutional. This is not moral. It is not ethical. There is nothing right about this. And when the executive branch has is is the 
the branch that's going around saying, if you don't follow these rules, we're going to somehow punish you. Then that same executive branch has the power to say, well, we're not going to punish anybody because that is unethical. And Congress can bitch and moan all they want, but they're telling us to do something that's immoral and we're not going to do it. And we need to be able to stand up to Congress and say that. All right, uh, Ben. Well, the solution, the real solutions are going to come from uh, our fellow libertarians who are running for U.S. House and U.S. Senate. And what we really need is st to start putting together our own legislative plans, our own ready to sign legislation that our, our, our House candidates are ready to introduce and that our, our our Senate candidates are, are ready to approve, and our, and our presidential candidate is, is ready to sign into law. And we need to demonstrate that level of organization and that level of unity uh, to the American people. Um, so I think that all, all of us candidates, we should start working with uh, our, our, House can our libertarian House candidates and our Senate can candidates for Senate on coming up with some legislation that uh, the members of our party feel good about that we're ready to introduce as soon as we get our first U.S. Uh, con you know, congressional candidate elected and on the floor in the House there. That's, that's where our solution's gonna come from. I mean, we can come up with great ideas and we've heard a lot of great ideas. We need to put them into something that can potentially become law that either takes away some authoritarian regulation that's, you know, narrowing the, the scope of the market, or uh, if it's a law uh, that needs to happen to, to empower the free market to, to start to fill these niches and create these options that drive these prices down and keep them down. I yield. All right, William. Sorry, I'm having problems with my uh, audio button here. Uh, the reason is uh, they're failing to repeal it is because of the amount of people that would be hurt by repealing it. Uh, and I do agree with what Ben said. No one person can actually make a decision on this. It's going to take a lot of minds together to find out what the best course of action will be to get rid of something that legitimately helps people uh, with all of its flaws as well. But we need to find something to replace it and that is going to take the work of not just all of us libertarians but it's going to take the work of every party and every american to give chime in to say will this hurt me or will that idea be better and so it's going to take actual democracy to get that uh taken care of and i yield my time arvin the Republicans controlled in 2016 the presidency, the House, and the Senate. And that wasn't enough for those statist welfare socialists to actually do anything about a law that they pretended to hate. Obamacare is the derivative of Romney Care, the darling of the more moderate traditional right. Now, I want to put the rest, some portion of this to the Libertarian National Committee, and I know that some of you are watching right now. What, whichever Republican lightweight you pick, whoever you pick as your hand-picked candidate is going to be part of that problem because the Republican Party, when they controlled the Senate and the House and the presidency, was not able to make any significant inroads on getting rid of Obamacare for one simple reason. They don't want to. They're part of this culture. When I say this culture has produced this government, I'm not just talking about Democrats, I'm talking about Republicans, and with due respect to the LNC, I'm talking to you as well, because you put out stuff talking about how this shutdown is disrupting the lives of federal workers, blah, blah, blah. The simple fact is this. The president can single-handedly get rid of Obamacare. Dan Behrman is exactly right. You just pardon all the people who violate it. And as president and partner in chief, I guarantee you one thing. If you do not enforce Obamacare, if you don't follow these healthcare laws, I don't care if you're a big fortune 100 company or a tiny little startup, I'm gonna pardon you. I'm gonna pardon you before you get to trial. 
you will not have to, if you choose not to follow, to buy an Obamacare approved thing and just buy whatever insurance you want, I'm going to pardon you too. I will use the power of the presidential pardon to nullify, to get rid of Obamacare. In the meantime, those of you who have the opportunity to serve on a jury, in the meantime, use that power and stay not guilty on any violations of Obamacare. Same. Uh, Christopher. <clears throat> you know, I actually don't think that the ACA is going to be that an issue that much longer. Uh, I believe that it was the Supreme Court out of Texas just ruled that to mandate a individual of the people um, purchase a consumer product is unconstitutional. Um, and then the other aspect of that is if you find one aspect of a legislative bill or a legislative act unconstitutional, it, it then actually renders the whole entirety of the ACA unconstitutional. Um, right now, I think that we, we probably got a lot of legislators at the federal legislative branch le level um, scurrying around trying to figure out how to, in fact, replace it. But the reality is government meddling in summary finds the people that don't purchase a product which drove up the cost for the product for a, a for the people and their employers increased the amount of a, a amount owed by the people that the insurance wouldn't re, wouldn't recover um and then it also increased the cost to do business as a medical care provider and damaged the profits and the medical care professionals in general so the, pro so the overall end here is what would happen is if we remove this whole mandatory malpractice insurance, we remove the mandatory third party administrators. Um, and instead we said, hey, you know, based off of a average of the uh, average revenue of your business, you put into a certain amount, up to a certain dollar amount into a trust fund. There, now you now you are actually making a return investment for this trust fund. It also is sitting there in the case of a malpractice instance. Um, you're going to see that it's not going to damage your employer. It's not going to damage you. You're not going to have to fight with an insurance provider on what they will and will not cover or who you can and cannot do business with because I think that that was a – best overlooked aspect of this thing is if you have a sh an insurance you go right. I need to go to the doctor I have to go to this doctor or this doctor or this doctor because that's who's in your network okay. all right uh, next question the largest cost citizens have in the entire realm of healthcare is prescription drugs before government oversight placebo pills snake oil poisonous and useless remedies were on the market the trade-off was that the medicine was much more affordable to most, the idea the free market would fix the problem seems like a fantasy because it already wasn't fixed in historical context. Would you change the current system? If not, how would you reduce the astronomical cost? If so, how would you explain how the free market will actually take care of it this time? We're going to start with Ben. Well, okay, so we're talking drugs, we're talking the FDA. Um, and the FDA came about, it was inspired by this book, uh, The Jungle. Um, it was over a hundred years ago. Uh, and it was a book that depicted some, uh, some people that had immigrated to the United States and were working in some, uh, some sausage and meat factories around Chicago. And you know, occasionally a, a person would fall into the meat grinder or something. And you know, that was pretty disgusting. So like people panicked uh, at the time. And, you know, they wanted some kind of security that this wasn't happening, you know, to their, to their food. And, you know, and it just got expanded in, into what it is today. And, you know, what didn't exist then? Internet reviews. Internet reviews didn't exist in, in the early 1900s. Um, the free market can provide the, the reviews that we need. Uh, if you're a drug company, uh, we don't need the FDA. We could have plenty of, uh, you know, people, if, if you want to be successful as a drug company, I would think that you would, uh, you, you know, you'd want to uh, maybe pay, pay for an inspection or something or pay for some kind of third party uh, 
uh, review uh, or um, anything that the government's providing there, I don't see why the free market and the technology we have today can't do a better job for, for far, far less. I mean, so much of this could be automated and online and, and doctor's visits could be as simple as this, this debate that we're having right here. Um, we have the technology. We just got to get the government out of the way. All right. Arvin. Here's how absurd things have gotten. The, one of the things you see happening today is off-label prescriptions. What that means is the government approves a medicine for one thing and doctors provide it for something else. Even doctors aren't taking the FDA seriously. One of the most expensive part of the FDA approval process is the efficacy requirement. You have to prove not just that the drug is safe, which would be cheap and allow us to lay off many, many FDA useless employees, but you have to prove that it's effective and that's obviously harder to do, much more expensive. It doesn't matter if it's effective because the simple fact is doctors will, it doesn't matter if the FDA thinks it's effective because doctors are going to discuss it with their peers, they're gonna look at their own experience, they're gonna read research papers about it. You buy medicine in America, unlike almost anything else, after consultation with an expert. What the FDA has done, it hasn't made us any safer, what it actually has done is made the price much more expensive, so people often just go without treatment. It has made it take much, much longer to get to market, so you have situations as depicted in the film, The Dallas Buyers Club, where people just make their own illegal black market versions. Yeah, when you turn something into a black market situation, you're not going to be happy with the results. The correct solution here is not to say, oh my God, we need to have the government protect us because no one's using the FDA in a serious way in the first place at all. Instead, we need to realize, as Ben said, that we are not living in the 1930s. We were that, there was no information age then. Now we're living in an information age. You can get as much information about any medicine as you could possibly want. You can look at the chemical formula, you can read reviews, you can read patient testimonials, you can read doctor analyses, and if you don't trust yourself to do it, you can hire a doctor to read them for you. Getting rid of the FDA is going to make the cost go down. It's gonna stop people from going without treatment. It's right. gonna make us safer. It's gonna make us healthier. Great. Let's go on to Chris. I still think that we as a nation believe a, a need to ensure that the narcotics that are being pr provided to our people are in fact what they are. Um, the anti-vax movement, one of the things that I found kind of staggering is that a lot of doctors don't even know and cannot get access to what is in vaccines. Um, this, it, it, we don't have that problem with the normal pharmaceuticals that are being provided to our people. We don't have that problem with insulin that's being provided. Um, but I think that we do need to make sure that we have regulations. But I think on the counterbalance of that, if we actually do things that are necessary to drive down the rest of the medical care provide costs, then we could maybe end up with a, an insurance that is exclusively offered for um, medicine itself. Um, but it, but to get rid of the FDA, I think is a bit of an extreme kind of approach. I believe to just be able to import any narcotic and say, this is the insulin that I'm going to use to save my life. And I don't know what's in it. Um, and to expect that somebody that died because they ingested something that maybe had mercury into their body, when it wasn't supposed to be there, I mean, it should be there at all, um, that they're going to in turn do a Yelp review or something like that. I don't think that that's a viable solution either. Um, it's a, it, this one's a, it, when you're talking about medicine, you're talking about something that's a little bit more complicated. Okay, Daniel. So Chris brings up a really interesting point and you know, I, I think it's a valid point. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, we're, you know, just like Arvin said, the FDA is, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's not really providing us any real value, but there is some real concern. People are taking medication and a lot of these medications are dangerous. If you take too big of a dose, if it's got contamination in it, you know, all these problems can, can happen that could literally kill you if you take bad medicine. So how do we prevent that? And it's, you know, right now, as useless as the FDA is, they, they do provide some sort of guideline for, for the review of medication. But we don't have to just sit around and say, this is the way it's going to be, and let's take some long process to get rid of it. All we really have to do is say, look, if you have, like Arvin said, if you have a cure for some disease and it's been sitting on the shelf because you can't get it through the, the FDA's crazy approval process, take it to market. But you're going to have to say this is not FDA approved. You can still sell it. You just have to say it's not FDA approved, which it's not. And if you do that long enough and allow it, what you're going to do is you're going to create a market for a third party to come along and say, look, the FDA is not going to approve it because their process is too expensive. We'll approve it. We'll certify it. We'll look at it. We'll examine it. We'll see what's in it. And we'll certify it. We'll, we'll put it through tests that aren't going to cost as much. But we're, we're going to create a new organization and we want this organization to have a good reputation and we're willing to put our name that this is good. And when you start doing that, you start creating free market alternatives. The FDA becomes absolutely useless and then you can just shut it down. And that's, that's really the route we need to go. It's non-intrusive. Um, it's, it doesn't create a lot of damage um, in its wake and it, it transforms us into a free market system where we have better options and, and more choice. Two minutes on the button. Uh, William, go ahead. All right. I do agree with Christopher and Dan here. Uh, there is a hefty case for medications harming people if it's unknown what is in that product. Uh, the FDA does actually check that, and they... They kind of give leeway to some of the people who pay them, uh, but you also have companies that, under a free market system, if we change to a free market version of the entirety of, of the prescription or the pharmaceutical industry, uh, they're bad actors, and they will take medications that people rely on, and as proof, Valiant. Uh, they raised a medication from $13.50 a pill to $750 a pill. The reason they can do that is because of patents. They have the patent on that, firm, or that medicine. Uh, a free market solution would get rid of the patent, but also give no incentive to develop the medication. So how would a company be able to make the, uh, make the effort to create all these new drugs if there is no way to recoup that cost? Uh, in a free market, everybody would be able to create this medication uh, and give alternatives, uh, alternative choices for who can uh, make this medication. Uh, Ah, uh, you opened my time. Okay, great. You're at two minutes anyway. We'll get more into marijuana during our criminal justice debate, but we're going to take the me a medical glance at it right now. Studies, physicians, and re research all unilaterally agree that CBD oil is a valid alternative for pain relief. Yet studies also show that full legalization increases hard drug abuse, crime, both violent and nonviolent, and dropout rates. If we authorize CBD for medical use, should it come with a restriction? Or do we accept that these negative side effects is an acceptable consequence for access? We'll start with you again, William. Uh, we actually have CBD oil as legal here in Alabama. Uh, marijuana is not. I have yet to see a problem with anybody using that. Uh, I've seen a lot more benefit. Uh, people use it for concentration problems. Uh, I haven't really seen people use it for pain relief. Uh, I think that more goes to marijuana or certain strains of marijuana. 
uh, and I do understand that it can help with joint pain and stuff like that. I, I haven't seen anybody abusing it. And I don't think that there's really much of a way to abuse CBD oil. That's one of the reasons why it is as popular as it is, even in places like here in Alabama, where people don't necessarily agree with other drug use. I do not see any way possible that CBD would in, uh, entice somebody else to use heroin or some other drug. Uh, the idea of, of any, the idea of marijuana or CBD being a gateway is simply ridiculous to myself. Uh, I have never seen that in my lifetime. So I yield the rest of my time. Okay, we'll go to you, Daniel. So I was just trying to Google this um, because I've, I have been told this uh, by someone who's, who's been a medical researcher um, who's very knowledgeable on the subject that the placebo has cured cancer. So when we talk about CBD and there's a lot of argument over, you know, some people will say, oh yeah, just smoke a joint. It'll, it'll cure your cancer. And other people are, you know, oh no, it's just the CBD. And some people are saying, no, there's absolutely no medical value to it at all. Um, it's possible that everybody's right. And it's possible that everybody's wrong. It's possible that, that some of the, some of the cures that we're seeing are actually just results of the placebo effect. The mind is, is absolutely powerful in the way that it controls the, the, chemical composition of your body, um, the, the things that create, um, that allow tumors to grow, the things that control your immune system, your entire body is an amazing piece of machinery that has so many different components. Um, so, you know, we talk about like all these, all these different chemicals and they might work different on different people. But, you know, we also talk about, okay, if, if we legalize CBD, is that going to, is that going to somehow cause somebody to start doing harder drugs like heroin? Does that matter? I mean, the reality is if somebody's taking heroin, they're damaging themselves. Um, I know Arvin always says that's the biggest, that's the best punishment you could give them is the damage that they do to themselves. But if I have a legitimate disease and CBD even has the slightest, tiniest possibility of healing me, even if it's only by placebo, are you going to tell me that I have to live with that disease or I have to suffer and die because that person over there can't control themselves and they're using heroin? All right, let's move over to uh, Benjamin. <clears throat> Nobody's getting high on CBD. And, and even if they were, uh, why does it matter? Um, how's that harm any of you? Uh, it certainly doesn't harm me. And if it, if it makes somebody feel better, um, I think that's a good thing. And, and what about the mental health aspect of it? Uh, you know, I've, I've seen people just completely freaking out, having a horrible day and uh, smoke a joint and, and, and feel so much better uh, for the rest of the evening there. Uh, you know, this is a plant that's done wondrous things for, for people for thousands of years. And it's just more the foolishness of, of the FDA. This is what keeps them in business. It's, it's, it's a racket. So it's, I think what some of us all keep saying here is it's a, it's a racket. Uh, they have their schedule one drugs that they say have no medical uh, purpose, which we know to be uh, false information. Um, we see uh, lawyers' lawsuits suing drug companies all the time. So all these drugs that the FDA is releasing on the market seem to, they're not even doing what they claim that they're doing. If, if that was the case, we wouldn't see advertisement after advertisement of uh, drug companies getting sued. Um, for the harm that they've done. They're, they're all FDA approved. Um, the free market can, can, can take care of it. They can take care of it cheaper. They can take care of it faster uh, and, 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 and more ethically. Um, we've seen uh, psilocybin, uh, mushrooms for instance, that, that helps people with the depression. Uh, these drugs that they say have no medical uh, use actually do uh, and they're fixing the market. It, I know that there's been a little uh, maybe debate over you know the FDA being a good thing here or not, but I'm telling you they're they're not, and the free market can do better. Right at two minutes, and let's move it on to uh, Christopher. 
as an American Indian, I believe in holistic remedies. I actually am opposed to utilizing Western medical practices. Um, marijuana, in its own nature, the stems and the stock can be used for fibers to create clothing, paper, the leaf itself after being steamed and having the THC removed can be used to create CBD, which has, according to some of the research I've looked into, caused uh, mutated cells such as cancer, at least some of them, to actually commit suicide. They break apart, a, a break apart rather than continuing to grow. Um, and THC is being it has been shown to actually provide be medical benefits to people with PTSD, um, social anxiety, and just normal stress as well as pain relief. We can utilize all of these things as a med as for our own individual medical needs. But I've checked the Constitution. Their government does not have the limited privilege to regulate a plant daisies, grass, nor marijuana. I don't believe, I believe that we, the first and most thing that we need to do is deregulate marijuana, not legalize it. I'm not looking to make a new cash crop or money venture for our corporate, uh, corporate interests nor our government. I'm looking to free the people. I yield my time. All right, Arvin, let's end with your thoughts. This is where we get to the heart of it, right? Are we going to be a nation where we treat adults like children, where we say that adults cannot take responsibility for their own decisions, where mommy government makes all our decisions for us, or are we gonna be a nation of adults, which says that yes, you can do what you want with your body, you need to pay the consequences. I believe in absolute complete legalization of every single drug of any kind. I believe that every drug should be as legal as tomatoes. Now, this scares a lot of people because they believe that some people are going to then try drugs and there's gonna be some damage. Yeah, no kidding, of course there's gonna be. We make mistakes in life, that's life. Part of life is you make mistakes and you learn from them or you watch somebody else make a mistake, suffer, and you learn from them. What we have today, instead of a responsibility state, we have a welfare slash regulation state going on. What we have, for example, in certain states, you have people who are unable to get a job working with heavy machinery because they can't pass a drugs test to the point that people can't find enough workers. These are states that have unemployment. They have people who are choosing welfare rather than work. The way to end drug abuse is to let people face the full consequences of drug abuse. When you're using drugs, you sometimes are going to have to make a choice. Do I take this job or do I take this hit? And a lot of people are going to choose both. But when more and more people realize that the option might be between living and starving, people are going to choose responsibility. We need to stop shielding people from the consequences of their adult decisions. I fundamentally believe adults are adults. You own your own body and you can do with it whatever you want. Time. All right, great. Moving on on a similar strain, countries have had a moderate success, uh, amount of success creating safe havens. Areas where people addicted to illegal substances where they can use these drugs. It has decreased AIDS and HIV, other diseases, reduced overdose, and help alleviate uh, addiction. Assuming you're unsuccessful in getting the FDA abolished or working around it or getting them to legalize any of their drugs, would you approve of funding to create a safe haven or for legislation that would allow it? Or do you have a different idea? Arvin, we're going right back to you. Let's call this like it is. What you said is a little reverse. It's not that safe havens are preventing people from getting AIDS. It's that the drug war is causing people to get AIDS. Banning heroin, banning heroin needles, one of the most insane moves by the state that I've ever seen, literally encourages people to engage in the high risk practice of sharing needles. 
that's being caused by the drug war. So let's not say that a safe haven is protecting us from people's natural behavior. This bizarre and unnatural behavior of sharing needles is caused by the drug war. Would I support funding for safe havens? No, I would pardon everyone. I've said it before and I'll say it once again, that if I'm elected, I'm going to be a partner in chief. On my first day, I'm going to pardon Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, and Ross Ulbricht, but I'm pardoning every single nonviolent drug user, nonviolent drug seller, nonviolent violent drug trafficker, nonviolent drug kingpin, as people like Ross Ulbricht. I don't think that the solution to a bad government decision is another decision to kind of counteract the first decision. That's like where you say that entrepreneurs can't start businesses, but we'll give you a welfare check. That's exactly wrong. We need to get the government out of this entirely. You know, I've, I've heard Christopher say a few times that people don't really care about what they put in their bodies, but if you go and watch people at a grocery store, they're looking at ingredients. Why? Because they don't want to put even sugar in their body that they don't want to have there. I imagine that you're going to see much more of that when you have an actual proper free marketplace for medicines and people say, oh, is this a medicine I want to use? And you're definitely going to have that if you have an actual free market for drugs. If you have a free market for drugs, you're not going to see these unpredictable quantities. You're going to see the predictable quantities that you see in all of the free market. Thanks. So uh, no, I don't support more government. I support getting government out of this. Fittingly, Christopher, it is your turn. I would like to first correct the narrative. I've never said that people don't care what they're putting in their body. I've said that you cannot trust what, what is on the label is what is in the bottle. Um, you can see that with like a lot of actually uh, supplements that they'll say it'll got some kind of root blend in it. And when you actually look into it, you do the test, it doesn't have that in there. But in regard to safe havens, no, I'm not actually for creating safe havens. However, I have done, I have read into them, I've looked into them, and I think that safe havens are a good thing. But I think that this is something that should be more of a community-based aspect of things um, and maybe something that is, is being provided by a charitable organization a non-for-profit by a for example um, they do do good things for it, it does prevent um, people from overdosing I don't know necessarily how it negatively affects AIDS but uh, AIDS or uh, blood transfusion diseases However, I could see where, where if everybody had their own needle, they had their own spot to use, um, that, and they also had the supervision to ensure that they didn't OD, that there would be, bad, there would be social benefits to that. But should government fund it? No. And I yield the rest of my time. All right. Let's move on over to you, Ben. Unmute there. Um, there something that comes to mind is um, we've seen uh, lately uh, gun sanctuary cities count or counties that are that are you know ignoring uh, federal gun laws. We've seen uh, uh, immigrant sanctuary cities that you know are you know or counties where they're ignoring uh, federal immigration laws. Um, I think we should start calling for. Uh, counties uh, and, and small local governments to start ignoring uh, federal uh, drug laws. Uh, I don't know what everybody here means by a safe haven. That's a really broad term, but when I think of uh, a safe haven or establishing a, a foothold, um, I think that that's something that we can call for. I think that that's something we might be able to accomplish. Uh, we've got a lot of elected libertarians on the, on the local level. Uh, perhaps that's something that we can experiment with. Okay, let's, uh, let's get William's thoughts on this. Absolutely. Safe havens are a great idea. Uh, sharing needles and, you know, the 
the issue with transference of uh, viral uh, of viruses by sharing needles is a horrible, horrible thing, and that helped spread AIDS uh, in about the 80s. Uh, that helped it become the plague that it is, or that it was. Having a safe haven is extremely doable now. Uh, that is something that can get taken care of the year of 2020, uh, just by deregulating, uh, just by deregulating some of the procedures involved with it. Uh, the needles themselves cost about 60 cents a piece. Uh, any charity can handle that cost. Uh, getting a nurse involved to help people with the dosage and all the rest of that would near, wouldn't cost nearly anything to a charity to be able to deal with. Uh, they could also give up some of their time, you know, donate their time to helping this. And it would it would be a good place for people to learn about the drugs that they're using instead of just using a drug, understanding nothing about it, and just having the feeling without without any knowledge of what's going on behind the scenes. You know, what what can this do to you? Well, if you're going to a safe haven, you might have a pamphlet that explains this while you're waiting on getting your high. Uh, not allowing safe havens is a bad idea. And I do yield my time. Okay. Let's, uh, let's end with you, Daniel. So if the question is, should the government fund it? The answer is absolutely not. Should they exist? Absolutely. Um, and you know, everyone, everyone brings up some really good points. Why? And I know a lot of people are concerned with, Hey, if we start, if we start allowing people to use these drugs whenever and wherever they want, that's going to create all kinds of problems. If you look at the states that have legalized cannabis, there are, you know, you can't just walk into like a, a CBS or a Walgreens and buy it. And none of these places are going to want to sell heroin because for the most part, these are, these are general stores. They cater to, you know, general people. They want people going there with their families. Um, they, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these big corporations want people to bring their kids there. The same reason, you know, Coke is sold on schoolyards because they want kids to get used to buying their product. Um, this is how, this is how big corporations think. They're not going to start selling hard drugs, um, you know, just because they can. So if, if we allow people, if we, all we have to do is say, you know, we don't have to fund anything, really. All we have to do is say, look, we're not going to send the police after people who are using these, these substances. I don't agree with using those substances. I would never use those, use those substances. I don't want anybody that I know to use those substances. Um, but the reality is some people are going to do it and they're going to do it with the black market. And that's what's making it dangerous. So if you, if you remove the criminal element, which is the government going around punishing people for acting according to their own free will, that's the criminal part of this. If you get rid of that, that's actually going to save you money. So it's not necessarily funding a program, it's defunding another program that's going to make everybody safer. Okay, thank you. Uh, candidates, we have three more questions, and then we'll end with your closing statements. The majority of our research into mental care, health care here in the United States is funded and produced by the government. Those who frequently discuss downsizing government put themselves at odds with victims and advocates of those who suffer from mental health afflictions. According to experts, we're at the dawn of understanding complex neurological and psychological issues and treating them. With the free market essentially leaving the issue untouched beforehand, should we expand it further, leave it where it is, or reduce or eliminate it? If the latter, how do you explain this to those who have untreated disorders with the knowledge that is only beginning to grow? And we'll start with you again, Arvin. If you want to see what happens when the government and pharmaceutical companies get together to manage mental health, you can look at the nationwide disaster that is Adderall over prescription. Today, approximately 11% of high school children are using Adderall. The cost is about $20 billion a year, which to put in perspective is almost exactly the same amount that we spend on corn subsidies. Mental health is complex. It's nuanced. 
I'm the first person to say we have a mental health crisis in this country. We, I see it in, in education. I see it among adults. Mental health is just as important as physical health. Our minds are what separate us from, our, from the animals and taking care of your mind, your mental health is vital. And that's why I don't want the government anywhere near it. The human mind is, in, is, a, is a wondrous instrument, but it's a delicate one. It's one that can be damaged by changing social pressures, by unexpected confluences of things ranging from social media to parental expectations. To put the government in charge of something that complex and that nuanced, we've seen what happens there. That's what happens when you put the government in charge of, well, in this case, mental health and Adderall, or when you put the government in charge of something as complex as education. Mental health needs to be handled by, through innovation, through new ideas, through compassion, through care, through actually caring about your customers rather than seeing them as cash cows. It is no place for the government. It is certainly no place for crony capitalism. This needs to be handled by individual entrepreneurs or by individual companies with a broader view of life. I don't want to see mental health damaged further by government. We need to get the government out of what it's doing right now, not let it do even more damage than it's already doing. Two minutes. Christopher, go ahead. The government has caused these problems. The, government's, uh, the government's scheduled regulation of a great many of things has caused problems and it has prevented, uh, prevented uh, the medical care providers to actually be able to do the research that they, uh, that they want to do and expand on that. Um, MDMA, uh, psilocybin, LSD, hallucinogens, Mar uh, marijuana. These are all, in a lot of cases other than LSD, um, are naturally occurring things in our environment. And as somebody who actually myself believes in holistic remedies, I've seen and read up on some of the medical report, uh, some of the medical reports, and unfortunately, those medical reports have to be done underneath very strict conditions here in the United States or in a, or abroad internationally we need to actually loosen up the medical care providers in those regards to allow them to explore and do the research mental health care is an issue we have in the united states whenever anybody talks about a drug addiction problem it's already been scientifically studied that's a mental health care problem it's not a crime and we need to start addressing it as such. And we need to start applying the proper remedies. If MDMA will help you with social anxiety issues and psilocybin will help you with, with your chronic depression and you have, and you have um, marijuana being able to help you with PTSD, then let the people use the things that will help them with their mental health care problems. And I yield my time. Perfect, two minutes. Uh, Daniel, let's, let's ask you on this one. How do you feel about it? So mental health is, is interesting. And, you know, like it's been said, everyone is different. And, you know, why people develop mental illnesses is all different. Some people are diagnosed with mental illnesses that they don't have. Um, you know, some people, they, their kids are extremely active, they're extremely hyper, and they're told, oh, this is, this is a disease. You can give them a medication and it'll calm them down when really, no, it's our nature to be, to be hyperactive. I've got two dogs. One is lazy and sleeps all day, and the other one likes to run back and forth up and down the stairs all day. They, it's, they have different chemistry and different um, emotions, and, and they, they act to their, they react to their environment differently. Um, and people are all different. And if you give government the task of trying to say, okay, there's a disease out there, whether it's depression or PTSD, um, any disease, like if you give this to government, what government's going to try to do is they're going to come up with a one size fits all formula that's, and they're going to try to apply it to hundreds of thousands or even millions of people who they have never even met and never even examined. And so while this is a serious thing that needs to be addressed, 
people need to have the freedom to address it however they see fit. Some people might seek psilocybin um, or other drugs that are that are illegal now um, to to treat PTSD that that have shown in medical studies to have real um, real valuable treatment uh, uh, medicinal properties for these diseases. And the government's just sitting around saying, no, you can't have that because a pharmacy hasn't paid the FDA enough money to go through all these procedures to be able to say it's a cure. And we, we can't have that. Government does not need to come up with a program to treat this. We need to allow people to, to make their own judgment and treat themselves based on the information that they can get from uh, from experts that they can consult with. Great. Uh, William, let's get your ideas. All right. I do agree with Dan on that one size fits all thing. That is definitely not a good way to approach uh, mental health. Uh, mental health is the Mariana Trench of, of healthcare. Uh, it's not uncharted territory but there are many aspects of it that people have no clue about yet. Uh, no doctor can say for sure that this kid has ADHD or this, that, and the other. It is a catch-all that people use. Uh, but outside of that, we do have some effective cures for mental illness, like, uh, like Christopher was talking about, the uh, use of marijuana for for PTSD. That I have seen personally how that affects people. Uh, I, had a, I had a friend that would wake up in the middle of the night, go after his gun and shoot at his room, uh, shooting people who do not exist from Vietnam. Uh, you could tell the difference. When he smoked marijuana, he never did that at all. Uh, off of marijuana, you had to worry about waking up at night to a gunshot, hopefully not at you. Uh, now, when we get into healthcare, uh, we also, we have also been through bad territories with healthcare, uh, electrolysis and lobotomy. So we do need to have, we do need to have somebody chiming in to say, hey, that might not be the best thing for everybody, uh, you know, where it's apparent but we should not limit any idea that says this could help one person, this could help another. That one size fits all is not going to work for healthcare because no two people are the same. There might be a few people in the same boat, but no people are the same. All right, let's end with Benjamin. Well, it's, it's not one size fits all. It's, it's one size fits no one. Um, if you, the more, the more you, control you give to government with mental health this we know how they're going to solve it they're going to solve it with with prison style system pri private prisons um and they're going to solve it with uh, pharmaceutical drugs um and you know what i think i in the spirit of, of continuing to talk about deregulation let's look at what it what often it is a, a, a lot of folks just need someone to talk to. Let's look at licensing. Uh, in order to become a licensed therapist, uh, you got to go through a lot. Uh, you got to you got to study, uh, you know, a, a lot of things that really don't have anything to do uh, with making people feel good. Um, you know, it's not all about uh, you know diagnosing or trying trying to label somebody with some type of problem and then they begin to identify with that label and then they think that they need uh pharmaceuticals uh to deal with this label when when reality they they just might need somebody to talk to and and they don't want to go pay a hundred bucks an hour they might not be able to pay or afford to pay a hundred bucks an hour or more to, to speak to a, a licensed therapist and if we deregulated that market some uh and made it to where people have more people to talk to for a more competitive rate because the, you know, the government wasn't fixing the market to uh, people with uh, these licenses that in a lot of ways are, are just overqualified for uh, just general uh, therapy that, you know, I think would uh, do a lot to ease people's tensions just to have somebody, somebody to talk to. Um, I'll yield. All right. Great.
Uh, doctors make an oath to cause no harm. Historically, medicine has always been a method of healing the body. With that in mind, one of our listeners, Lynn Blair, asked, do you support physician-assisted suicide? Should our medical professionals be willing and able to kill someone upon their request? Arvin, as luck would have it, we're starting with you again. You own your body. That is the first and fundamental principle from which all else flows. You as an adult have the right to do what you want with your body. And that includes if your life, if your life has become too painful, too full of suffering, you have the right to end it. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there that say, well, if you want to kill yourself, just kill yourself. You don't need to bring a doctor into it. And that, and that really brings out just how tragic some of these circumstances are and how little people really understand about this issue. The reason that many people seek doctor-assisted suicide is because your arms and legs might not work. You might not be physically able to do any kind of suicide. You might need the help of someone. And since you're already suffering enough, you might want the help of someone who knows what they're doing, who can do this as comfortably and as painlessly as possible. To allow somebody to, sorry, to force somebody to continue to exist in a life that's just pain and misery, that they've grown tired of, that they want to separate themselves from, is barbaric in the extreme. Laws against doctor-assisted suicide are beyond cruel. They're beyond indecent. They show no respect for humanity, no respect for a person's basic dignity. I'm going to do everything I can to end all restrictions. You have the right to live as you choose, and sometimes you have that right to die as you choose. And listen, there's, there's no chance that this is going to start to like encourage other people to die or what other nonsense people are saying. Everyone's primary drive is to stay alive. But sometimes there's something else that is even stronger. These are such extreme cases. And I believe we need to treat people with decency and compassion and remove all laws against doctor-assisted suicide. Great. Uh, William, let's turn that, uh, that over to you. Yes. In the case of taking care of your patient, you do not want to prolong their life so that they can die in pain. Uh, physician-assisted suicide is an ethical question to the doctor and to the patient themselves. It is not a question that we have a right to step in and say unless we are in the situation ourselves. No law should be able to state that a physician cannot end the life or assist the ending of somebody's life if they're suffering to the extent that they no longer want to live. And I have seen people in this position. Uh, I haven't been able to help them with this position, but I have seen people begging to die. And while I don't wanna go into all those topics, uh, I can definitely say that assisted suicide is, is not a bad gesture. It is actually a gesture in good human nature. And I yield the rest of my time. All right, uh, Ben, how do you feel about it? Uh, I, you know, it's one of those topics that makes people uncomfortable, but uh, the federal government certainly shouldn't be involved in it. Um, and when you look at the ethics of it, uh, if, if, if somebody is, is willing to go through, uh, you know, their physician, to, to seek uh, that remedy, uh, who, who or any of us or the government to tell them that they can't? I mean, um, you know, uh, what gets me is, is people euthanize their, their pets uh, when their pets get old and start to suffer and, and can't no longer have a quality of life. Um, and that's, that's a, a, a humane, ethical thing to do um, at, at a certain point. Why can't a person make that choice for themselves? Who is, who's anybody to, 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 to say that, that, that they can't? Anyways, I, I yield. 
All right, Daniel, let's head over to you. So this is, this is kind of a difficult one for me because a few years ago, my mom passed and this was, she had a, a, some type of a blood disease that they were trying to treat with some alternative form of chemo that they gave to her. And it was just, she was in so much pain. They gave her, they gave her so much morphine and she just kept screaming from the pain. Like they could not give her enough uh, to make it stop. And ultimately, you know, and, and there are so many, so many ways that this went wrong from the beginning because they said, you know, we had a doctor who said, you know, we asked about um, cannabis treatment and they said, oh, well, you don't know what's in those. You don't know about the dosage. We're not even going to try it. Um, and so they, they use this drug that, you know, has like a 1% success rate. The, the whole system from the, the whole thing from start to finish was just always just wrong. And in the end, you know, when they, they finally say, okay, well, let's try chemo one more time. And, you know, my mom was kind of, I mean, what do you do in that scenario? You have a doctor there who's supposedly an expert who's telling you, look, your life is on the line. This is your only option. What are you going to do? You're going to trust that person. It's a really difficult decision to make. And why do you trust that person? Because the government says, oh, this person's qualified. This person hasn't saved that many lives. There's no cure for this disease, but, you're, but you should listen to her because she's an expert. And so when you get to that point, we couldn't even ask her what she wanted to do. She, like, the, the only way to stop her from, from screaming from excruciating pain was to give her so much medication that she, was, that she was basically sleeping, unconscious. And if she were awake, I don't know what she would say. I know if I were in that position, I know what I would say. And if I were to say, hey, just give me something and put an end to this, you, you have to give that to me. Because if you don't give that to me, all you're saying is, no, you are my property and you will suffer until you die because we can't do anything else. And government does not have the right to say that. Okay. Uh, last question before we get to our closing statements. <clears throat> There's perhaps no greater tragedy in American history of healthcare than the VA hospitals. In a series of scandals, it was revealed the wait lists for life saving care were years long, doctors were non accessible, hospital conditions were barbaric, and maybe most famously, the policy of cross them off and pretend they don't exist, quote unquote, when they would die were all revealed. The problem with privatizing the market is they largely all have pre-existing conditions, mental di disorders, and active injuries, but these were caused in service to our country. Do you have a plan somewhere between letting them die waiting for care in a government system or letting them die in the streets in the free market? Please tell us about it. And we will start with William. Our veterans gave up their freedoms whichever reason they gave them up for was to protect our freedoms. And that's how they view it. The majority of them view it when they go in. Why would we treat them this way? It makes no sense. And we, we put, or our government has put our veterans in positions that they should not be in. And like some of the posts about uh, some of, the rest of us candidates that were in the military as well. We did not make the choice to go out and harm other people. We made the choice to protect our country. That is, that is the view that we had. Uh, well, that is the view that I had. I can't speak for other people. Um, when it comes to the VA, people just ignore veterans. It is expected that veterans are going or soldiers are going to die and they're going to suffer so no everybody turns a blind eye to it nobody actually cares they care more about the person sitting in the hospital waiting an hour to be seen about a cut on their foot than they do about one loveless man 
who has PTSD and may have shrapnel, uh, may have shrapnel in his body that is poisoning him. The, the, the biggest issue with it is that people don't actually care. And I've seen that from many people. It is a touchy subject and I will yield the rest of my time on that. It's all right. Two minutes. Uh, Ben, let's move to you. I've never heard a veteran tell me that the VA was just the bee's knees. Not once. It's always, it's always a complaint. And that is your, that is your big example for government being really involved in healthcare. And do we want that for the rest of the country? You know, socialized medicine. That's, that's what they have. These VA hospitals need to be liquidated. Um, they're not doing a good job of providing care. These veterans, uh, there's millions of veterans in this country. Uh, they could easily uh, come together uh, and, and, and do a, a group rate insurance purchase. Um, there's so many ways that that, 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 that could be done. Uh, and then they could, they, could, they, could, they could buy their health care from whatever hospital that, that they want to go to. Uh, they're not obligated to go to this one hospital that, you know, basically has a somewhat of a monopoly on their health care. Um, they, they can go where they can find quality service. Uh, it's a bad deal. It's, it's a great example of super uh, micromanaged, you know, government uh, services. Uh, and, and we shouldn't do anything like that for the country as a whole. And, and we can do better for the veterans. Uh, a better deal can be negotiated. We've got a monopoly and that not, monopoly needs to be broken up. All right, let's move over to Chris. I am opposed to middleman tactics. And that's exactly what the VA is. is it's a middleman between the veterans and their medical and and their medical care providers. Um, rather, instead, what I would do is I just go ahead and dissolve the VA altogether. Um, veterans did actually put their life on the line for this country. Oftentimes, I believe that the veterans were lied to, misled on to what they were actually doing. But that's beside the point. They put themselves at li put their lives on the line for this nation, as they saw it. And they are in, in, in oftentimes they, they, they came back with some pretty severe injuries. So just go ahead and let them go to whatever doctor they want to go to and send the bill to the Veteran Affairs Commission and let the Veterans Affairs Commission pay that bill. It's, it, it's as simple as that. We don't need a government ran hospital because government's not good at anything. It's not good at regulating health care. It's not good at actually doing it, hardly anything efficiently. So just let them go to the doctor they want to, send the bill to the Veterans Fair Commission, and let the Veterans Fair Commission deal it, it, handle it with Congress. And I yield my time. All right, you got a lot in. Uh, Arvin, it's your turn. Today, Doctors Without Borders provides better care to the wounded people wounded by the U.S. military than the VA provides to veterans. Now, I'm no fan of the military industrial complex. I think it is a bad decision to enlist in the military at this time. I think it is an immoral decision to enlist in the military at this time. To the young men and women watching right now, before you even think about enlisting, talk to some veterans. Visit the VA, visit the Veterans Hospital. See what it's really like. See how much these puffed up recruiters, the other side of the recruiting pitch. See what, what actually happens besides, you know, seeing the world and developing skills and whatever other nonsense they're telling you. See what, how they actually treat you after the fact. But all that said, the way that veterans are being treated in the United States is criminal. The idea that people are being treated like that, even though they've done something that I believe is wrong, even though they've done something immoral, that is not a way to treat another human being ever under any circumstance of any kind whatsoever. What we need to do is get the government out of it. We don't need more government the rest of our lives. We need to get the government out. We need to abolish the Veterans Administration entirely and let the free market handle it. 
The free market is already handling the other side of it. Doctors Without Borders, you know why they can do so much? Because they're not regulated. Because people are decent. Because people want to help people. When you combine decency with a lack of regulation, you're able to provide health care in areas where you would think it would be totally impossible to do that. I want to see doctors within borders. I want the do those same doctors to be able to provide that kind of compassionate care here where people need it. Now, the, you can't really just send the bill to, as is because, you know, veterans have gotten a lot of injuries and that's expensive. What we need to do is lower the cost of health care by getting the FDA out of it, getting rid of regulations, making this affordable and treating people decently. All right, time. Uh, and last up is uh, Daniel. So in 2014, when I ran for the Texas House of Representatives, I talked with a lot of vets. There's, there are a few military bases um, in San Antonio. They're all over Texas. And, you know, I did hear a few of them that said they liked the VA. But, of course, these people were mostly healthy. So they go to the VA and it's no big deal. They get something small. They get Tylenol for a headache. It's, they like it. To anybody else who's had an actual injury, they hate it. To anybody else who has PTSD, they hate it. There was, there was a veteran who supported my campaign uh, because it was, against ending, uh, it was against the drug war, for ending the drug war. And what he told me was that they were giving him, you know, they, they were giving him a couple pain medications that just weren't working because he fell from like a 20 foot um, tower and broke his back. They didn't give him any surgery for years because they, they said he was some sort of stable, even though he was in constant pain. He, they gave him painkillers that didn't work. And he, all he wanted to do was use cannabis because he knew when he smoked it, it made that, that was the only thing that would make the pain go away. But he had to keep that a secret because if they found out that he was using cannabis, they would have, they would have removed him from all the VA programs. Um, taken away his benefits, give him a, a dishonorable discharge. He would have suffered all these consequences because the VA says, no, we already have a program for you. And that's the program you have to take. And if you don't like it, you can get out of here and deal with it yourself. And you can, you can forget every promise we ever made to you. So that's how the VA treats these vets. And it's terrible. And we, we can't have that. And if we get rid of this bad healthcare system that we have in the private sector, any veteran will be able to go to a private doctor and get the treatment that they need. They don't need to get it from government because government is completely incompetent when it comes to this. All right, two minutes on the button. All right, candidates, thank you so much for your answers to those questions. It's now time. Uh, it's now your time. Uh, three minutes to deliver your prepared closing statements and let the people know how you feel overall on healthcare. Uh, we're going to start with you, Christopher. Yeah. Um, well, first off, I'd like to actually thank Dan. Dan, you came up with, a, in this conversation, the idea of privatizing the FDA. I think it's a beautiful idea. I think that it's something that we need to all come together and actually explore. Um, but government is horrible at doing business. Um, they, we've seen, I, I've discussed numerous, a couple of times now, what it had, how the massive failures of the Affordable, uh, the Affordable Care Act actually caused this nation. Um, I think that health insurance, manda mandatory health insurance, mandatory pro providing of health insurance by your employers, mandatory malpractice insurance for the medical health care providers is all bad and it actually drives up the cost for the medical care providers and in the end drives up the cost to the people utilizing that in consumer service goods. Um, so we have some ideas we have some solutions we'd like i'd like to actually see that come into play and very shortly here you will actually be able to find a, a health care policy that i will be implementing as part of my marks for christopher marks for president 2020 campaign uh thank you very much for sharing time with me everybody and i yield my time okay let's uh let's hear hear your closing statement william All right. Uh, one thing that I didn't get to tag on to the VA discussion was the first responders of 9-11. Uh, they fought 
for years to get any kind of coverage and they sacrificed their lives to go up into those buildings. A lot of people ignored them. And up until I think it was last year or the year before, it took them that long to get coverage. Uh, they would not be able to afford any kind of health care otherwise. A lot of them, a lot of them don't have that ability. And I think for I think for people that have provided a service to the country, I think that the country actually owes them a favor in that aspect. Uh, now, when it comes to the rest of the closing statement, our Constitution starts off with, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and here's the important, uh, the important part, provide for the common defense, promote general where, promote the general welfare. It doesn't say we need to provide the general welfare, but it does say that we need to promote it. So federal government does need to promote, promote the general welfare of everybody, not provide it. Uh, healthcare for all, the overall question of this, this uh, discussion, it would help in that aspect, uh, not in the way that it is proposed now, but a general sense of it would get us to a point that that um, charities would be able to take over, and once they once they can step in, allow them or, or allow people to contribute to healthcare instead of forcing people to pay for it. And then we could start on one big insurance program to cover people, because that is the basis of insurance. The more people paying in, uh, the cheaper that coverage would be, uh, along with some other things like taking care of the overall cost. And once you knock that cost down, the cost of the insurance wouldn't cost as much. So by reducing by reducing the overall cost, taking away some of the regulations, we can reduce healthcare to a point where people can contribute and donate money to help everybody else. And once we get to that point, we can drop any sense of government involvement with it. And that is a progressive step towards the direction Thanks. of getting rid of government in healthcare. All right. Uh, up next, Arvin Vora. 1950s quality of care with 21st century technology. That's what I have to offer. Imagine where you had that same care, that same in-home care, that same convenience, but, with, but souped up to modern standards. We could have healthcare that would be almost unimaginable today if we just made a few simple changes. I want to use a classic example comparing LASIK to the EpiPen. The EpiPen, that's 1910s technology. It's adrenaline inside of a syringe. Thanks to government, the cost of it has gone up from about $100 per pen to a few hundred dollars a pen. That doesn't come with any skilled labor, by the way. You have to do it yourself. It's a really simplistic device. Now let's go to the opposite side, where you have not no government, just less government. You have things like LASIK, science fiction level technology, delivered by highly skilled workers, highly skilled providers, skilled labor plus advanced technology. It's gone from tens of thousands of dollars per eye down to a few hundred dollars an eye, about the same as an EpiPen. That's what free market education means. It means that things become affordable, really affordable, not someone else pays it for you. I'm not talking about welfare. It becomes actually affordable. And here's how we achieve that. It's by getting the government out of healthcare. It's by ending the FDA. Recognizing that today in the information age, we don't need a backwards government institution giving us bad information that not even doctors are taking seriously anymore. It means ending licensing requirements so that the cost goes down so we no longer live in a world where we say, oh, should I go to the doctor this month or next month or the month after that when I can afford the copay? No, make it so affordable that we go check in. 
getting cancer screenings when it would be curable rather than years later when it's no longer curable. These are the types of changes. Getting the government out of healthcare, it's a way of extending life. It's a way of preventing unnecessary diseases or preventing disease from becoming too big. It's a way to make sure that we can actually have that price competition that we see everywhere else, that incentive to find lower cost ways to achieve the results rather than finding excuses to raise the price. That's what it means to get government out of healthcare. Now you're going to see a lot of people saying, well, Republicans can do it. We can get a Republican. No, they can't do it. They had the House and the Senate and the presidency, and they still couldn't do it. But let me tell you one thing. If I'm, the, if I'm elected, I will do it by pardoning everybody who violates these nonsensical laws. Learn more about me at votebora.com. Three minutes on the button. I think you might have practiced that. Uh, all right. Let's, uh, let's go to uh, Daniel. So... Healthcare is something that we all need. And it's really important that we realize that we're the only ones who have enough information to make an intelligent decision. Government, it can say, okay, look, we can, we can look at different medications. We can set some guidelines as to how they should be tested. But ultimately, you are, you are the one who needs to make the decision. When government says it's illegal for you to take a certain medication because they haven't approved it yet, what they are telling you is you don't have the right to decide to use it. They're telling you you're not stupid enough, you're, you're too stupid to make that decision on your own. They're telling you that, that it doesn't matter what you think is right. It doesn't matter if you're going to die soon. You don't have the right to make these decisions for yourself. But the reality is we are not government property. We have the right to make these decisions on our own. Taxation is theft. and Another, and that's what government is really great at, is just stealing from us. First, they steal our money, then they steal our choices. That's another big theft. When they tell us, you can't take this medication, or you can't have this procedure, because we haven't given you permission, that is a theft of your life, and your liberty, and your, your ability to make decisions for yourself. You own yourself. It's your own body. You need to be able to make these decisions on your own. It's, it's ridiculous to think that these politicians that most of us have never even met in our, our entire lives, we're going to give them all of our money in, in some sort of tax system or healthcare system or insurance scheme. We're going to give them all of our money and we're just going to have to trust that they care enough about us to give us the right kind of care when we know they're already taking bribes from all these big pharmaceutical companies. It doesn't work. We need the right to make these decisions on our own. We have that right. It's, it's our fundamental human right. It's protected by the Constitution in the Ninth Amendment. Go, read the, go look it up. Go look at the Ninth Amendment. It's there. We have rights. Just because it's not listed out there does not mean we don't have those rights. Go learn more about me at Berman2020.com. It's B-E-H-R-M-A-N-2020.com. And just remember, we are all free. We are not government property, and we need to start acting like it. All right. Last one, Ben, uh, ben Letter. Well, I think this, this debate was spectacular. I think all you guys did a, a, a great job. Um, we heard a lot of good ideas tonight. I think we, we put out the, the essence of what the, the libertarian perspective is on this. What we really need now is uh, around 535 or so uh, people to run for U.S. House and Senate to help us put some legislation together that any one of us would probably be willing to sign. We need that. We need to waive up our health care plan, our health care deal as a, as the libertarian party and that's something that's beyond the scope uh of of what just the the five of us or six of us here uh can do um the executive branch isn't the legislative branch we need some legislation if you ever thought about running and veto bad ideas <clears throat> yeah um but if you've ever thought about running uh, consider the Libertarian Party. 
Uh, we have ballot access all over the place. Uh, and, and you could be a candidate for, for U.S. Congress. And if you happen to, to, to work in the medical profession, we would love to, to run you as a candidate and to allow you to be an advocate for deregulating medicine. Uh, my name is Benjamin Letter. Uh, you can find out more about me at benletter.com. And uh, another little piece of information that I think we'll all find useful, uh, the, uh, the hashtag vote goal. I think we've all used it. Um, I, I purchased the votegold.org uh, domain a couple of years ago. That now forwards to the Libertarian Party LP.org uh, 2019 candidates page. So anybody can use that votegold.org and that forwards straight to the list of all the official uh, 2019 Libertarian candidates, all the current candidates. Find your candidate, find a candidate in your area support them and consider running yourself. Once again, my name is Ben Letter, benletter.com. Candidates, thank you so much for your time. Ordinarily, at the end of the episodes, I want to uh, ask everyone to subscribe to our Patreon because that's what keeps us going or throw us a like or give us a high review. Uh, you can throw all that out the window today. What I really want you to do with these and going forward with the rest of these debates is to share them. Share them with your friends. The candidates spend a lot of time in preparation for these debates. They've dedicated over 20 hours of FaceTime just to being in this chat and talking about these issues. They have a lot that they could be doing. They need to be fundraising. They need to be uh, out there being the politicians that they are. And they've decided it be it was a worthwhile time to spend with us. We always get good response with these episodes. Uh, you know, our average on We're Libertarians, we hit over 10,000 views across the platforms. You know, debates like this with big names and, and hot takes, we might get 12,000, 13,000 views. I want to see that up over 20,000. If you know someone who works for the LNC, the Libertarian National Committee, make sure they find this or a link to this. It's important for them to see the candidates that we're running and what they have to say. It's important for your friends to see it to see all this preparation that they put in, that we have this idea for an America that is more than the status quo, that we are talking about challenging topics, that we address difficult questions head on. I asked questions about as hard as I could from a perspective that, frankly, even I don't have, because I want to make sure that they are battle tested. And I believe that they are. Again, candidates, thank you so much for your time. To you and to the viewers, keep fueling the fires of liberty.